I was working in restaurants mainly, doing a lot of, you know, full service. You're serving dinner, you're talking about the menu, you're doing a lot more things. And then my first shift at PDT, it was full on cocktails. 85% we do were making cocktails. I woke up and I felt like I got hit by a truck. It was an adaptive process, to say the least. I like this, man. Your throne this is, is like the soda. bitter throne. Yeah. We are the Helicopter Company, and this is On The Menu. This episode of On The Menu is going to feature Jeff Bell, head bartender and proprietor of PDT. Please don't tell Cocktail Bar. What are we going to talk about with Jeff? He's a good bartender, so we should avoid that as much as possible. Talk about the other stuff in his life. Mm. We'll get into some of that, of course. Well, originally from the Northwest, right? It'd be cool to hear his story from going from west to east, making his way to New York City. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then what's the constant thread that allowed him to get to kind of where he is today? What's his key kind of perspective on how, how he did it and, and why he's successful doing it? PDT is that bar that has a phone booth as a secret entrance, right? What do you see? Like, what, what's, the, what's the amazing part of what you see and that you get to learn? And, What's the not so fun stuff that you get to see and get to learn? You see, you see breakups. I'm pretty sure I've seen a divorce happen. You know, a woman slammed her hands on the table and was like, this was, it was like, I was 18 at the first place I worked at. She was like, I'm finished. And then she left and the guy just like sat there and I was like, Luckily, we're in like a special occasion kind of bar where, you know, people don't come here. Regulars don't come here on a, on a nightly basis or multiple times a week. People are usually in a great mindset when they come here. It's more celebratory. The struggles that the bar industry is going through as we deal with um, uh, kind of like the growth of the industry and the, the popularity of cocktails and how people in this position now get their, their ego stroked more than they did before. Mm -hmm. um, People don't think about those things when they switch, like, oh, I used to be a lawyer, I want to be a bartender now because, you know, bartenders have a cool job. Jeff, you have a reputation in the business of being um, incredibly influential, but also humble. And I think those are two things that are potentially conflicting. How do you, how do you deal with, like, not having an ego in the position you're in? At some point in my career, I found that having an ego about what I was doing just became a distraction. People don't make a journey to visit you and they don't like want, people don't want to have your cocktails because their life's going to change. They want to go out and have a good time. We can control the flow of our room without being like authoritarian figures behind the bar. So I think that once you realize that, you don't have to have people like bend to your will, but you can help influence the way they do it. And, and you can do that by not necessarily having to be right. Bird two. How did it begin? Where is it? So it's named after Jean Bertou, who was the inventor of the sidecar apparatus, which was then, That's you know, cool. the namesake for the very, the most famous, probably the most famous brandy cocktail. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, a little nod to innovation. We don't want this to just be plugged into the pipeline of classic brandy cocktails. That's not a bad thing if that happens too, but it also had to pass that, it has to pass that test. Does this make a good julep? Does this make a good Sazerac? Does this make a good sidecar Alexander Collins highball? Boom, it does. So we succeeded in that part. And now we want people to kind of recreate drinks in that, in those, you know, those mother sauces of cocktails and, mm. and create their own. And that's the idea behind it. You went to school for philosophy and was hospitality in the back of your mind as well? H how do you bridge the gap? I started taking classes that I liked and I happened to enjoy the discussions and the readings of my ethics courses like applied ethics, you know, philosophy of religion, environmental ethics, and social justice, and political theory, and stuff like that. Like, I like those a lot. And our education system is, is flawed in the fact that you're supposed to figure out what you're going to do for the rest of your life mm -hmm. when you haven't lived. Totally unrealistic. So, hospitality is something that I kind of gravitated towards as a, a necessity to uh, complement my, my course load. You know, my junior year, I had a roommate that was, uh, was an engineer, a uh, mechanical engineer, had a great job. He made a lot of money right out of college, and it was, that, was in, that was a cool thing to think about. And most nights of the week, he fell asleep reading contracts or something that was not exactly entertaining. And that was like his life. He made a lot of money, and, and it, I was like, oof. <laughs> no time to spend it. I'm kind of glad, yeah, I'm kind of glad I didn't do that. But I, you know, so I just kind of maintained course. At what point 
did your career and aspiration shift from being the head bartender at PDT to being a bar owner to being an entrepreneur with your own brand? My first job at a restaurant was washing dishes and then it was busing tables and then I bugged the manager about wanting to learn how to serve. Then my serving skills aren't at the level of server skills of Seattle, Washington at that time, so I have to go as a barback or a busboy. So then I went busboy to server, and then I turned 21 and I was bugging them, you know, <laughs> can I bartend, can I bartend, can I bartend? At that point, I was always attached to something, whether it was school, my parents, a relationship, and then at one point after I graduated, I was working this job, and I'm like, I'd broken up with my, you know, she had broken up with me. It's a, it's a true story, but <laughs> it was probably the best thing. You know, yeah. my dad, I called my dad, I was like devastated. I'm like, she broke up with me. And he was like, she just did you the biggest favor. <laughs> and my God, she did. I was like, I'm moving to New York. I gave myself six months to, to, to squirrel away some money so I could move. And then, you know, obviously I spent all of that very quickly when I got here because the cost of living is significantly higher. I don't know if they still do this everywhere, but like, because I haven't had to get a new job in like 10 years. But it's like, you have to have a headshot, five years uh, New York City experience, and I'm like, how am I supposed to get five years city, New York City experience? But, you know, obviously wait five years, I mean, can't do that. I got a job at McCormick's in, in Midtown, uh, which isn't there anymore. Went to Mylene as a server and a daytime bartender, and then worked my way up to head bartender. My boss there was Val Meehan. Her husband is Jim Meehan, who is one of the founders of PDT, and he's like, I got a bar backing shift available. I'm like, I'll take it. You know, oh, pick up a serving shift, oh, pick up a serving and a bartending shift, and then became the head bartender within a year. But I found that my my path, where it's like you go, you drop, you know, you take the, it's like take the step back to take two steps forward kind of thing. And I realized that your life goes like this. It's like, but you have to move forward while you're doing it. Let me ask you this. You know, bar back, server, bartender, head bartender, consultant, owner, what's the constant? Well, I think consultant's like the lamest term ever, so I try not to use it. Let me do that question over. <laughs> no, no, <give> it. <laughs> What's the last part? So entrepreneur. Barback, bartender, head bartender, designer, owner of bar. There's got to be a constant that, that connects all them together. What is it? If you're stuck on being something, some title, then you won't take that step backward to be a barback because you'd be like, that's not my job, which are like, some of the scariest words to ever hear in a restaurant when somebody says it's not my job. It's like, well, then go get a fucking new job because you're not to, you're about to not have one anymore. Um, so, you, so not worrying about titles and and, and and thinking about what you're doing in that moment, but what can, it can do for you in the future. And that's that's like the most important thing because if you think about the what, then you, you're not focusing on like the how and the why and all, all the other things. I think it's an arbitrary aspiration to. to to seek the labels along the way because the labels, it's just a, whatever people assign or ascribe to me that's, you know, that's their prerogative. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it's luck sometimes? Um, is it that you're manifesting it because Jeff can do it? Or is there some other yeah. thing at play? It's, it's, I would say luck is a big part of it. It's not everything, luck, timing, opportunity. I think that you can only make so much with the tools that you're given in your life. You just can't do it by yourself. But I think that luck, so luck in, in the people you, you, you're surrounded with when you're um, in your upbringing. But as you move forward, you kind of start to be able to choose who you spend your time around. If I was born in the 90s and moved to New York now, I don't think I would have the same kind of trajectory because this industry is a lot bigger now, so the line to the front is a lot longer. So yeah, there's, there's things that Somebody else would be doing this if I wouldn't have done it. Luck is luck is a big thing that you, you but you can help control some mm. of it. Mm -hmm.